And now on to the dinosaur of the day, Draco Rex, which was a request from Marcos. So thank you. Marcos also sent a lot of helpful links. It's a controversial dinosaur. In 2009, Goodwood and Horner said that Draco Rex was a juvenile Pachycephalosaurus and Stygimoloch was in between an adult and juvenile, and Pachycephalosaurus was the adult, based on the fact that they had relatively similar skulls. If you want to learn more about those other dinosaurs, we talked about Pachycephalosaurus in episode 93 and Stygimoloch in episode 176. So we probably mentioned Draco Rex briefly in those two. Yes. Goodwin and Horner suggested that this dinosaur, Pachycephalosaurus, grew and changed shape as it aged and that Draco Rex was a half-grown version and Stygimoloch was a three-quarter grown version. Draco Rex was described in 2006 by Bob Bakker and Robert Sullivan and others. According to Bob Bakker, Stygimoloch is different because of its huge spike cluster. It's got these three enlarged spikes. On the back of its head. On the back of its head. And Draco Rex has a shorter four-spike arrangement on the back of its head. And the two had also different sized and shaped skulls. So pretty big differences. Yes. Also, Pachycephalosaurus has this broad rounded dome compared to Stygimoloch that had a narrow dome and larger horns. Draco Rex did not have a dome on its head, but instead had knobs around two big holes. And they also had horns that were shorter than Stygimoloch. And the skull had bumps and a long snout and was flat. And there's also a lot of osteoderms, the nodes, larger hornlets, and spikes. The skull has these two large holes, the fenestra. So in an interview, Bob Barker said that he was thrilled with the idea when he first heard this theory that Pachycephalosaurus, Stygimoloch, and Draco Rex were all the same. Because no other modern species has done that kind of transformation. It is pretty radical with the horns and the dome and everything changing over time. Yeah, Yeah, well, yeah, so Horner's proposal is basically that the horns grow out of the back of the head as a juvenile, and then it reverses and reduces as it reaches maturity, and then the horns disappear and the flat forehead grows upward and becomes a solid dome of bone, and large openings in the skull close quickly. But then Bakker said that he'd studied horn and dome growth in modern animals, musk oxen, giraffes, African water buffalo, and none of them have any kind of reverse horn development as described for pachycephalosaurus. Yeah, that's the pig question mark for me too. (laughs) Why would the horn shrink if you're growing this other thing for display? It's very strange. Right. And in the case of something like Triceratops, the skulls change over time, but the horns, they start small and grow larger, not the other way around. Bakker also said that he had a genuine juvenile pachycephalosaurus skull about two-thirds the length of an adult, and the skull had, quote, a shape that's 95% like the adult stage. Hmm. So I've got a longer quote from him. He said, quote, the horns are small, the temporal holes are gone, and the dome is huge, and dome development has distorted the neighboring bones above the eye. This juvie pachycephalosaurus is just as small as the Draco Rex skull at the Indianapolis Children's Museum, but the juvenile pachycephalosaurus had already acquired the definitive pachycephalosaurus head structure. It doesn't look anything like a Draco Rex. We have new Stygimolox skulls, too, the same size as the Draco Rex. These Stygis skulls are not intermediate in shape. They have a small dome and large horns, the diagnostic Stygimoa cranial configuration. So, though electrifying in its novelty, Jack's theory simply doesn't work. Pachycephalosaur dinosaurs did grow like triceratops or like musk oxen. Bumps and horns simply got bigger and thicker all through life. There was no sudden dramatic growth reversal. By the time an individual pachy had achieved half-grown size, its dome and horns were taking on the shape that was very close to what the adult would have. End quote. So you can see the two sides of the debate there for sure. Yes. In 2010, Nick Longrich and others said that all flat-skulled pachycephalosaurs were juveniles. Bob Bakker said, quote, Draco Rex was the first flat-headed pachycephalosaur found in North America. Bakker said, quote, Draco Rex is a scientifically significant milestone in the world of paleontology. It proves that family trees were still branching off and evolving even near the end of the age of dinosaurs. It demonstrated a world of color and movement in nature more recently than we ever thought possible, end quote. So Draco Rex looks very dragon-like, as you might have guessed, based on the description of the skull. <laughs> it was about 9.8 feet or 3 meters long, and it was herbivorous. It was part of the family Pachycephalosauridae. By dragon-like, do you mean that it had horns sticking out of the back of its head, like dragons are usually depicted? Yeah, and also just all the stuff going on with its skull in general. A lot of ridges and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So Draco Rex was most similar to Stygimoloch, somewhat similar to Pachycephalosaurus. 
The skull is similar to the modern animal giant forest hog. Both have similar length skulls and long snouts or muzzles. Giant forest hogs shove with their skulls and ram each other, and they have powerful, flexible neck muscles and can lift opponents off the ground. As the fight escalates, the giant forest hog runs into each other, and then they ram their flat skulls together, sometimes fracturing bones. Jeez. That makes me think those studies where they say, you know, they wouldn't have slammed heads together because it would have fractured something. It's like, well, <laughs> maybe it would have. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't do it. <laughs> That's interesting. Hard to say. So Draco Rex may have pressed their heads together and then pushed, and then the knobs and ridges on the skull may have helped hold the skull together to prevent slipping. The spikes on the back of the skull also could have inflicted fatal wounds on the flank. So Oryx, which is a modern antelope, used their backward-facing horns to kill predators, so maybe Draco Rex and Stygimoa did something similar. Interesting. Like a self-defense rather than a display structure purely. Yeah, could be. So Draco Rex was found by Steve and Pat Salisbury, or brothers, and Brian Buckmeyer from Sioux City, Iowa, while on a fossil collecting trip. They donated the skull to the Children's Museum in Indianapolis in late 2004 so that it could be studied. They found one nearly complete skull and four neck vertebrae. The type species is Draco Rex Hogwartsia, and yeah. the name means Dragon King of Hogwarts. That's and such a good one. Yes, it is Harry Potter. So, and Draco, even though it's Dragon King, it's really named after Draco Malfoy. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Bob Barker and others named it, and then they let J.K. Rowling know. And in a video with Bob Barker, he said that she was a fan of the name. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? Yeah. Barker said, the quote, the species is named in honor of her contribution to children's education and the joy of exploration. And he also said that the name Hogwarts came to him as soon as he saw the skull. Interesting. More of that dragon-like resemblance, I guess. It's a good way to name something. It doesn't have any sort of implied behavior in it. It's just kind of what you think when you look at the skull. Mm -hmm. So even if it turns out to not be what you thought it was, it's not like, oh, I named it a Ceratopsian and it's not a Ceratopsian. It's cool. I named it a dragon. <laughs> and it still looks like a dragon no matter what it actually is. <laughs> yeah. So Raleigh said, quote, The name of Draco Rex Hogwartsia is easily the most unexpected honor to have come my way since the publication of the Harry Potter books. I'm absolutely thrilled to think that Hogwarts has made a small claw mark upon the fascinating world of dinosaurs. I happen to know more on the subject of paleontology than many might credit because my eldest daughter was Utah Raptor obsessed, (laughs) and I am now living with a passionate Tyrannosaurus Rex lover, aged three. My credibility has soared within my science-loving family, and I'm very much looking forward to reading Dr. Bakker and his colleague's paper describing, quote-unquote, my dinosaur, which I can't help visualizing as a slightly less pyromaniac Hungarian horntail, end quote. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So since then, Bakker and others have found four Dracorex specimens, and Dracorex lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now North America. I hope that they leave it as its own genus just because I love that species so much. And I know that's not a scientifically valid reason to want a genus to say unique, but... You just like the name? I still, yeah. (laughs) Sort of like you and Brontosaurus. (laughs) Yeah, but that one's real now. Don't forget it. (laughs) For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino or click the link on the left. 